Aloha. Welcome to American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host, and today's title is Trump's Decline Before Our Very Eyes. Before the debate with Donald Trump, during the debate with Donald Trump, and certainly after the debate with Donald Trump, uh, the media scrutiny on President Biden was pretty intense. Many Americans saw what looked like a cognitive decline during the debate of Joe Biden, and certainly the scrutiny from the media uh, basically resulted in Joe Biden withdrawing from the 2024 presidential campaign. Uh, a monumental thing not done since President Johnson back in 1968. But the question is, what's going on with Donald Trump? We are going to examine some of the bizarre words, comments, and certainly actions from Donald Trump. Why is the media not focusing its attention on the cognitive decline, the bizarre behavior of the former president of the United States? And with me to discuss that is my special esteemed guest, Chuck Prompton, and my co-host, Jay Fidel. Good morning, everyone. I don't take great pleasure in having to bring this topic up. It's kind of a, a sad day when uh, you have a, a presidential candidate that was a former president and now is running to be the 47th president. Uh, he is the party's nominee, the GOP's party. And we're getting some really bizarre, strange behavior out of Donald Trump, as we always have, but now even more so. So, Jay, I'm going to go down just a quick um, hit parade list of some of the bizarre things Donald Trump has said recently. Uh, and then I'm going to get your comments and, and find out from you what you think's going on. And certainly with the media, uh, is, it, is it starting to focus in on Donald Trump or is it doing what it usually does, ignoring his bizarre behavior? Uh, number one, uh, he has accused, Donald Trump has accused the the Kamala Harris Walls campaign team of introducing AI to basically grow a crowd of, of supporters in front of, a, of the airplane that Kamala Harris and Tim Walls were, uh, fl flew in on for a campaign stop. He's saying that the crowd was completely uh, added in as an AI te technology, um, not accounting for the thousands of people that were actually there and are white witnesses to the fact that they were there at this campaign rally on the tarmac. Uh, number two, um, Donald Trump's not only doubled down, but tripled down to insist that he was in a helicopter emergency with San Francisco former mayor, Willie Brown. Uh, Willie Brown has been discuss has discussed this with the media. He's been interviewed and he, he's, he pretty much knows that he was not in that helicopter once or ever with Donald Trump. Yet Donald Trump can't let it go and he insists that was the case, and he caught up the, the New York Times and said, uh, you know, complained that uh, their reporting was inaccurate. So that's number two. Number three is um, Donald Trump has this, this habit of resurrecting the name of Hannibal Lecter from Silence of the Lamb movie, a 1990, early 90s movie. Hannibal Lecter is a cannibal, and Donald Trump is basically starting all his campaign uh, speeches by saying, He'd love to have you for dinner. He's from the insane asylum and they're letting their people out of the same asylum. So he's using Hannibal Lecter as a cannibal to tie into the immigration issue. Um, we have others that we'll talk about in the course of this, this show, but Jay, what is going on? And number two is why, or is the media starting to focus in on his bizarre, more bizarre behavior and decline? There was a character called Holden Caulfield in Catcher in the Rye by J.D. Salinger years ago. And um, after the Catcher in the Rye book was so popular, he wrote some short stories. And one of the short stories was A Good Day for a Banana Fish, where Seymour, who was his brother, um, was there at the beach in Florida taking care of a small child. And <clears throat> Seymour said, uh, do you see the banana fish? And gentlemen, I'm, I'm here to tell you there's no such thing as a banana fish. And he asked over and over again, do you see the banana fish? And the young girl, I think her name was Phoebe in all of this. Uh, uh, Phoebe said, no, I don't see the banana fish. But Seymour asked again and again. And finally, and finally, Phoebe said, yes, yes, I see the banana fish. And the reason she could see the banana fish, even though it didn't exist, 
was because she loved Seymour and she loved Holden Caulfield in family. And so what you have here, and you know, that we we need to explain what's going on. For example, you didn't mention it, Tim, but he's been focusing on Hannibal Lecter, who is a madman. And he never explains why, except to say that Hannibal Lecter was a monster, a fictitious monster in a movie, uh, The Silence of the Lambs. How many years ago? The 80s, was it? There are people out there, you know, uh, in in his following um, that say, I, I understand, this is an article in the paper this morning, I understand it. Just like Phoebe said, I see the banana fish. They say, I understand the connection between Hannibal Lecter and Donald Trump. They say, what? What is that? That's not so. But there are people out there in the cult who will believe anything he says, even a banana fish. And, and I'm telling you the parallel because I think there really is a parallel here. And that's one reason why the people in the cult buy all the nonsense that he's selling. So if you look at it from that point of view, from their point of view, you get the banana fish scenario. You paint a very, very convincing argument. Uh, the question is, why didn't they do that with Joe Biden when he was stumbling and, and having forgetful moments? Um, everyone loves Joe Biden. Uh, yet the Democrats, 70 percent of them said he needs to step out of the race because he's not making sense. What, why is the treatment towards Joe Biden so vastly different than from Donald Trump? My view of it is that the media is always looking for raw meat. It is looking for eyeballs uh, because eyeballs translate to profit. And the culture, if not the business model of the media, television especially, um, is to find raw meat. And uh, it, it's Trump set it up because he knows how to manipulate the news cycle and the, me the media. He's always done that um, to try to point the, the fickle finger of uh, the fickle finger of uh, raw meat at Joe Biden. And remember, you know, when we have studied the, uh, the, the principles of psychology and social psychology, we've talked about projection, which seems like something that Trump has done all his life. He has a problem. He has a weakness. He has a mistake, um, but, but he projects it on someone else. That's textbook, Psych 101. And so he knows he has a problem. His, his father had a serious Alzheimer's problem uh, and was blotto at the end. Uh, which was around Trump's age, by the way. Um, so he projects it on Biden, and the press buys it because it's raw meat. He's giving them raw meat, and they take it. And this is regrettable because it's a press culture in this country that is that is really mm, inappropriate, not consistent with principles of journalism and all that. But he has undermined the principles of journalism all his life. And he knows how to do that, and he's done that. And they buy it, and they still buy it. You know, last week's, uh, quote, press conference for an hour where he rambled and gave us no news at all, um, they covered it. They all went down to Mar-a-Lago and covered it. And when it was over, in fact, uh, Kamala Harris had a speech, and the press did not cover that. And Lawrence O'Donnell criticized them royally uh, for the failure. Uh, likewise, uh, millions of people picked up on um, Elon Musk's uh, ridiculous and failed uh, uh, Twitter. I call it Twitter. I still call it Twitter. Uh, Twitter, quote, interview, softball interview. And millions watched it. So all I'm saying is that people, you know, like to see what Trump is doing. He's a celebrity. He's a um, he's a um, he's a reality show. Uh, just as The Apprentice was a reality show. And they do not, let me offer, they do not make intelligent evaluation of what he said. When somebody who actually analyzes the remarks he made in that um, press conference uh, last Thursday, they will find there was nothing home. Uh, and the question ultimately, Tim and Chuck, is whether the people um, in the cult get it or whether they still don't see 
that we have a declining president on our hands, a former president, and for that matter, a guy who cannot run a campaign and talk to us honestly and come up with real policies and articulate real positions. And furthermore, and this is the worst part of it all, the guy who would be president and can't hold it together. You can't trust them with the nuclear codes. And do they see that? You know, we all here on this show anticipated that the decline would accelerate. It is accelerating. And so um, the scariest part of all is not that Trump is a bad temper, which he really, really is, um, but that he can't handle it anymore. And if he wins somehow by virtue of the people who follow him around, uh, he is going to be the most dangerous president we've ever seen. Thank you, Jay. Chuck, let's um, tag on to the part where people are starting to notice. Um, I think we all noticed back in 2015 on, on what a strange character Donald Trump was, and certainly with a lot of his, his ideas and policies. But now uh, we're seeing these non sequiturs just come out of the blue during his campaign rallies, his, his press conferences. Is the media starting to focus in on Donald Trump as a result that they're not focusing in on Joe Biden's age and mental acuity? Are they now starting to see the obvious and are starting to report it? Um, I'm seeing a lot more articles. I'm seeing a lot more guests, psychologists, psychiatrists uh, being interviewed about the decline of Donald Trump's acuity, mental acuity. Uh, do you think that's the case? Or um, is Donald Trump just being crazy, crazy as a fox, and uh, trying to uh, create great distractions as usual to get the attention of the media set back on him versus Kamala Harris? It's a question that goes so many directions, Tim. Take um, it any direction you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, the most tempting direction is to say the one thing you can count on with Donald Trump is that it's not going to be truthful. And the signal of that is whether his lips are moving. That will tell you. Yeah, we, we know that. Um, I think even his followers know that. Uh, but when you're in a cult, you, you forgive it and you ignore it. Uh, good point. Well, there's a couple of things that seem to be going on. And this is the stuff the media really does not report, although the polls are signaling it. Where is that massive Kamala Tim gain in the polls coming from? Some of that is from that 30% that were galvanized Trump supporters. They're just and, and I think it's not just the fact that he can't put together a coherent sentence. I mean, we asked each other before the show if any of us could remember the last time that he did put together an articulated coherent sentence, and none of the three of us could remember one. I'm only 78, so that goes back for a few years. But yeah, that's, that's a problem. But the other problem that I think is hurting him more is everything he does say is the same old, same old. And people are really tired of that. Mm -hmm. They were beginning to get tired of it in 2020, and you saw that, and Joe Biden won. They were getting a little more tired of that in 2022, and the Republicans who were counting on huge gains in the House and the Senate did not get them. They barely squeaked through on the House, and now with people leaving the party, departing, they're down to the slimmest of all possible majorities in the House. And they've had a minority in the Senate for this entire three and a half year period. That's not looking to get better. You're not hearing anything out of the Republican side that is new, that is different. And the stuff that is directed toward Kamala Harris whose name he can't even pronounce, Trump can't even pronounce correctly, and Tim Walz, is stuff that is the easiest of all. For Trump to say, here is a professional woman who all of her life has been Indian and Black, has never renounced that, has never shied away from that, has always put that up front and center, and here's a guy saying, is she Indian? Is she black? Does she know? This is from a guy who up until four and a half years ago was not orange. And now he is. 
okay, if you want to talk about people changing their spots, here's a guy. But look at the content. There is nothing new. There is, because, and I think you've hit on something, that you know, Donald Trump's speeches are old retreads of stuff he used seven years ago, six years ago. I mean, he's been, used, he's been in constant campaign mode for seven, eight years. And he's run out of material. He needs a new writer. But that's the question. Is he coming up with these folksy, bizarre, uh, non-secular kind of stories uh, to try to jazz things up and try to engage and keep his audience engaged? Uh, I'm sorry, but when he says the late, great uh, Hannibal Lecter, he's a good man, um, he's got to have some strategy behind this. I just can't think that he's unraveling before our very eyes, which he may be well doing, but there has to be a Donald Trump rationale here somewhere. Uh, help me, Chuck. Is there one? See, and you've identified, I think the helicopter story is really emblematic of that deterioration because I don't know if you folks have seen it, but the truth of the helicopter story has finally just come out within the last few seconds. It was not Willie Brown. Hey, it was another Brown. It might not have even been Jerry Brown, but they found a Brown who said, I was once on a helicopter with Donald Trump. And he told the story of what happened. There were three of us on the helicopter. There was a pilot and me and Donald Trump. And the helicopter rotor went out and we were going down. And the pilot said, I'm sorry, there are only two parachutes. And Trump said, I'm the freaking president of the country. I'm taking one of those parachutes. And he jumped out. And the pilot said, I don't know what you want to do. And this guy Brown said, I'm not worried. He just took my backpack. That's what happened. <laughs> I, knew, I knew this was coming. I've heard this joke before. Well, you know, that, that raises a very interesting point, <laughs> a very interesting direction. You know, that um, it's very ironic that he was criticizing Joe Biden to a fairly well about Joe Biden's, um, you know, loss of acuity. Um, and now, you know, uh, the, the focus is back on him. Uh, and it's ironic. It's almost delicious. By the way, footnote is if you if you hadn't noticed, Joe Biden has lost a certain amount of acuity, but Joe Biden is still the president. He's the president of the United States. And the and the, the media is not really focusing on him anymore. It's turned the hot lights onto Trump. And and part of that is the ironic nature of this projection. Um, and there there's uh, stories uh, increasingly in the press um, about Trump and his acuity. There are jokes. There are comedians. There are parodies. Randy Rainbow has done a very good one. And, you you know, there's a groundswell of humor, just as, you know, Chuck's joke. There's a groundswell of humor against Trump. And, and I think humor is, is really a deadly, a deadly problem for Trump. He can't handle that. Narcissists can't handle humor. They can't handle being made fun of. Okay, so I think there's a there's a turning here, um, and that includes at least some of the press. You know that uh, Trump got in trouble with Fox News because they they actually um, uh, printed uh, published uh, a uh, a Lincoln Project uh, ad on Fox News, and Trump went nuts about that. And he blasted Fox News. So now he's mad at Fox News, his best friend. And he made these, all these uh, you know, defamatory statements against Fox News, uh, even though they've been supporting him. Um, so I think that relationship may be different now. And I think a lot of the relationships he has had uh, with otherwise uh, supportive media may be changing because the, the raw meat is now Trump. The humor is now Trump. People want to tune in and find out what kind of nutso things Trump did today. I think we are in a turning. Well, that's interesting because I distinctly remember watching Donald Trump being interviewed by Sean Hannity. And Sean Hannity literally spoon feed him the question and the anticipated answer about not uh, taking vengeance against uh, President Biden, not taking uh, retribution against the Department of Justice. And Donald Trump wouldn't take the bait. He refused. 
And uh, look at Laura Ingram trying to do the exact, exact same things about Trump's comments about how Christians will never need to vote again. And, and, and Laura uh, Ingram did everything in her power to steer him back onto the road of sanity, uh, but Donald Trump refused to do it. So if, if Fox News is now taking a new turn to let Trump hang himself with his own bizarre comments, I haven't seen evidence of that yet. And um, I guess maybe I'll be watching Fox to see if they have turned the corner on Donald Trump. They're going to go where the power is. And if they perceive Trump to still be a winner, they're going to stick with him. Um, but I think uh, they also see that uh, Kamala is uh, looking like she could be a winner. And um, and she's more interesting. She's a much more appealing person um, on video, on television. And they're going to spend time with her. And I think that's that's the direction, because she and Waltz are a great combination. They're interesting. And you know what? They know what we're talking about. They watch carefully and they're rational and they're going to say to themselves, gee, uh, you know what, what, um, you know, uh, that, that we have to do stuff to blunt and demonstrate uh, how crazy he is. By the way, there was an article in, recently in the paper about what should Kamala do to deal with these insults? And uh, there was uh, a social media post uh, written by her where she just made sort of generic statements. Uh, I can read it to you if you're interested. Um, just made generic statements about, um, here, statement on Donald Trump's interview with Elon Musk. This is from something called uh, Kamala HQ. Donald Trump's extremism and dangerous Project 2025 agenda is a feature, not a glitch of his campaign, which was on full display for those unlucky enough to listen in tonight during whatever that was on XCOM. Trump's, and this is the takeaway, Trump's entire campaign is in service of people like Elon Musk and himself, self-obsessed rich guys who will sell out the middle class and who cannot run a live stream in the year 2024. It's not playing at the same level as Trump, um, but it is the kind of answer that this particular writer, and let's see, this was um, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a pub called Queerty, Queerty, Queerty Q U E E R T Y, uh, under a, a headline Kamala Harris's campaign has the best response to Trump's hot mess interview with Elon Musk. So that's the kind of article that's coming out now. Chuck, do you agree that uh, maybe uh, the friends at Fox um, are starting to abandon um, the defense line, his protection line, and they're going to just let him hang himself with his own words and, his, and give him enough rope theory? Um, do you think more people are tuning in with the morbid fascination of a future car accident with Donald Trump, as they did probably with Joe Biden when he got in front of a microphone, or certainly at the debate, I think a lot of people tuned in to see what how uh, Joe Biden was going to perform, and they they certainly got a result. Are we at that point now with Donald Trump? I, I'm not sure it matters that much because I think the same thing is happening to Fox that's happening to Trump. People are tired of it. There isn't anything new. It's the same old, same old. It and it doesn't produce anything. It doesn't improve the economy. It doesn't reduce inflation. It doesn't reduce your gas prices. It doesn't reduce your grocery prices. It's just gobbledygook, garble. And yet, if you turn on the TV and you watch Kamala Harris and Tim Walz, they're fun. They're entertaining. They are honest. They're sincere. And they live what they say. If they say it, they can show you they do it. Tim Wall stands up there, defends his military record, and he says, I have one thing to say about J.D. Walls. Thank you for your service. And he moved on. This is a guy who lives the kind of respect and understanding that connects with the values. And he had, takes a joy in it. There's an energy there. We talked about this some last week. They are much more motivating and fun and enlightening and entertaining to watch, which is interesting because the media itself 
is a reflection of that 1%. Rupert Murdoch is not your average ordinary guy. He's not Fane, the United Auto Workers guy. He's never gonna be out there on a picket line. He got banged for multi, multi millions of dollars and he dumped Tucker, Tucker mm -hmm. Carlson. Okay, Tucker Carlson has kind of dropped down into oblivion since then. Nobody pays attention to him. Every once in a while he gets a, a little attention on Fox or whatever. But what's really going on here is the whole tone and tenor and spirit of the conversation with the people has changed. The media can either follow that and show it or not. The guys that are somewhat more objective, the NBC news is, the guys like that, the guys who are not trying to be combative, competitive, journalist warriors against the other side. They're not enemies of other journalists. These are the guys, the Atlantic, the Guardian, that are putting, this is what's happening out there. So watch, pay attention, enjoy. One point that Chuck makes that's really important is that Trump is fighting old battles. Um, you know, I've heard it said, and I've seen it in writing, that Trump is still living in the 80s. Yeah. The issues he is concerned about, the approaches he takes uh, are the same approaches he took with the media back in the 80s. And he's gotten away with that because, you know, Biden has not never did figure out a way to, to deal with it. Um, but now uh, Kamala can and is and her good nature is uh, overcoming Trump's uh, battles with figures and issues uh, out of the 80s. And the question really is whether he can update himself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know that he has a lot of uh, acolytes around him who are handling him and trying really hard to package somebody who is who is misguided and declining. They're trying hard and maybe they're good at it. But so far, we haven't seen that. Um, the, you know, the problem is, is Trump going to listen to them anyway? Well, let uh, me and go the there. answer is probably no. Let me go there. Uh, I'll quote uh, famous New York Yankee baseball player Yogi Berra. Uh, also coach for the Yankees for a short period of time. And his famous quote is, it's deja vu all over again. Donald Trump lost the 2022 election as a direct result of him claiming that the 2020 election was stolen from him. He couldn't get off that point. Um, that bizarre statement, that BR behavior, plus the January 6th uh, riots that he spurred on, um, seemed to be the nail in the coffin that forced that forced voters to say, I, I can't, I can't go with this. So the red wave, the red tsunami never happened in 2022. Is Donald Trump doing the exact same thing here for 2024? Is he picking these bizarre topics, living in the halcyon days of the 1980s and uh, picking issues that are not important to, you know, the bread and butter issues of the, of the kitchen table for uh, families across America? Jay, what, what's your point on this? Oh, um, he's, he's focused on old news. And, uh, you know, the answer to the question I last posed, uh, that is whether he had the ability to change and update his approach. Um, the answer is probably no. So I would like to pose one important question to both of you guys. So here we have examined, you know, his situation, his psychology, um, his style, his narcissism, his projection, all that, uh, and his lying you know, by virtue of all these problems he has. On September 10th, there will be a debate unless he backs out yet again. This is a possibility because he knows he's in decline. Um, if there is a debate between him and Kamala Harris, wow, you know, there's, there's going to be 80 million people watching that. You can count on it because they want to, they want to see raw meat. They want to see whether Trump can handle it. Mm -hmm. Last time they wanted to see whether Biden can handle it. Now they pretty much know what Kamala Harris is like, and they want to see what Trump is, is capable or not capable of doing. And I would like to pose the question to you, both of you, is what is going to happen on September 10th? What does that look like? Woohoo, Chuck, <laughs> I'll let you go first. I, I think we've seen some pretty good previews of that. Virtually every Trump press conference in which particularly non-white female journalists asked him hard questions, he folded. 
literally like a wet blanket. I mean, he literally was not able to respond. One of the classic ones was a very articulate Chinese journalist for might have been the New York Times, might have been the Post, one of them, asked him some hard questions. And he came back and said, basically, are you asking me that question because you're Chinese? He is becoming his father again. He's reverting in loss of control of his mental faculties and his emotions to exactly the person he was raised to be by his father. It's a racist, white supremacist, money grubbing, whatever it takes to get it. Hey, and I think one of the great quotes that I've heard in recent weeks I was talking with one of our court clerks on the neighbor islands. And she said, I don't really want to raise politics, but I have to say, you know, when I watch Kamala and Tim Walz, I'm comfortable. These are people I would welcome into my home. I would be happy to have them talk with my family. This guy, I don't want him anywhere near my neighborhood. And that's the difference. Somewhere, the kind of person he is, is now coming out because he can't mask it anymore and his troops can't mask it anymore. And it is the same. And people are starting to sense that. His 30%, I guarantee you, is not 30% anymore. 42 of his former cabinet members cast a vote of no confidence that they would not vote for him in this election. 42 of his chosen cabinet members. What does that tell you about this guy? Well, I think your claim that 30% are no longer his 30%, that's, that's a significant claim because once you're in the cult, you stay in the cult. And his 30% has been in the cult. Not Sarah Matthews. Uh, who was in his staff in the White House and who testified in Congress? You remember that? Mm -hmm. yeah. She came out against him big time. And what what was the what was the uh, uh, the her comment? He, he doesn't have it. He's lost it. He's lost his faculties. Um, so I think you're going to see more of that. You are seeing more of that. And again, the question is whether that can cross the divide into well, the cult and whether the cult will accept it. All right, we're running out of time, but I want to go to this question that you just raised, and that is... Well, and real quickly, Tim, you know, the 42 cabinet members answers your question exactly. Those were cult guys. Those were high-level cult guys. They're all out, publicly out. They're disavowing him. Oh, good point. So, uh, Jay, is are we going to see an increased viewership of the September 10th debate as people waiting to see evidence of Donald's psychopathy? Or are they gonna be watching to see how he can um, avoid the topics by bringing in his folksy uh, stories about boats and batteries sinking and how that's gonna be safer to stay with the boat versus a man-eating shark uh, 12 yards away? Um, <laughs> what, what's going to attract those 80 plus million, maybe? I don't know how many million are gonna tune in for this debate, but is it, is it uh, the schadenfreude, as you you know, use that term, to see what Donald Trump does and whether he's a disaster on the airways or not. Different strokes for different folks, you know. Different people are going to want to see different things. I can only tell you a lot of people are going to want to see a lot of things. I mean, I would watch it to see how well Kamala does. I want her to be sharp. I want her to respond to his lies. Uh, I want her to have her minds together like... Uh, you know, if you want to talk at me, talk it. Tell if you want to tell me something, tell it to my face. Mm -hmm. And she's done a number of lines like that. A very powerful speaker. Remember, she's a lawyer who was in court a lot, and she she knows how to how to speak the language. Um, he doesn't know how to speak the language, and I think she probably has an edge. Now, some say that you know she hasn't been involved in a debate like this before i guess she was in what in 2020 she was involved in a debate but i'm not sure that counts um so the question is uh whether how well she will um, perform uh and the question is also whether she can stop him and for example just suppose he gets up behind her like he got up behind hillary clinton and he got into the frame of the camera and uh, essentially sucked the oxygen out of her comments um, is she going to let him do that? Uh, is the media going to let him do that? I mean, there's so many points in play here that um, uh, people will want 
They'll want to see what's going on. They will want to see him do his thing. They will want to see him do her do her thing. Um, it'll be a lot of people. And some people will want to see him win, you know. They believe everything he says. We see that in some of the YouTube, uh, you know, shorts where they, they get up and repeat his crazy statements. And they're serious. Some people are going to watch it for that. So you're suggesting the circus without free bread. Okay. Um, we've run out of time, so uh, Chuck, in the context of the media's focus between now and Election Day, um, in the context or the question, will is the media going to focus its attention on Donald Trump's mental acuity as they did with Joe Biden, or do we just continue on for the next uh, 80 some plus days and that doesn't become a primary issue with Donald Trump's candidacy? I think, honestly, and it's a great question, Tim, and I think the best response to it is a question that we're going to be looking at for the next two and a half months. And that is not whether Kamala Harris can sustain who she is and Tim Walz, that, that is who they are. Are the media going to follow the people? The people are gravitating to Kamala and Tim. That's where the energy is, that's where the joy is, that's where the honesty, the sincerity, the truth are. That's where the people who live what they say are. People like that, they're comfortable with it. The only question for the media is whether they will follow the people there or not. And Tim, your point is probably the most important point of all. Trump cannot just break even on this debate. He has to win it decisively. Biden lost it for him. Kamala Harris is not going to do that. Well, and if he comes off as kind of uh, his psychopathic tendencies, I don't know how that's going to uh, resonate with the independents, the former Republicans or the current Republicans that don't like Trump, and certainly with everyone in between. So we'll see to what degree he goes off the rails and either decisively wins the debate or falls apart and disintegrates and um, that will then affect polls further. But I agree with Jay, um, always expect the unexpected. Yeah, and, and never voluntarily debate an experienced prosecutor. <laughs> All right, we've run out of time. I wanna thank my special esteemed guest, Chuck Crumpton, and as always, my co-host, Jay Fidel. This is American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host, and join us next week. And until then, aloha.